Hello, I'm Noir Nerd, and um, this is going to be quite a long form video, so um, really it's a video for programmers, to be honest, uh, who are interested in programming and sort of, um, I guess, high level discussion of a programming project, a current one that's not actually finished, but I basically want to talk about the um, Papyrus 3D library. Room. Uh, or framework I'm developing at the minute for A-Frame, which allows for creation of uh, interactive fiction games using A-Frame WebGL engine to uh, create interactive environments which work in VR, AR, uh, web, and desktop. So I'm going to talk a bit about how the sort of architecture I'm going to talk about, just how I've approached this. This is a work uh, work in progress code base. There's a lot of stuff in here actually that I do want to trim out. There is a lot of stuff I want to refactor and tidy up as well. Actually, at this point, though, it is it's sort of like an in, in between zone. This project has jumped around a lot between making a lot of iterative protests, uh, pro QS, not protest, and then um, having to like take things back a bit, strip things out, so. But it's that sort of project, especially because it's the first sort of attempt I've ever made of building a uh, system or something equivalent to a game engine. So uh, I suppose I open up the README class. I'll, I'll try and actually let's demo what it actually is for now. So let's do the demo of npm run dev. npm start doesn't actually do boot it up at the minute. And I'll just click this link at the top. And, uh, so this is how it looks. You move around with the mouse, or if you're in uh, AR, VR, it'd be with your head. Like that. I'm just going to click that start game. There will be sound, so it'll mix a bit of the music I'm playing, but yeah. So you've got a little enemy there you can shoot at. So it's basically at the minute, it creates a FPS sort of like environment, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a gun that the user uses. Uh, and with this test version, I'm trying to basically create a. Um, so obviously, got the gaze based movement. I've got this little character here you can interact with. A little bit of a dialogue there. And I'm just actually currently working on that to associate different dialogues with different specific characters. Because before, it's just um, looping through one giant file, which I'll go more into anyway in a bit. So I'll talk more about how the actual dialogues work, how the loading works and, and that. It's basically done by a JSON, but I'm currently still working on the perfect way to do that. So for example, if I just move a little closer to this guy, just move a bit closer to him, scroll through these dialogues, it will just loop around, around, around. Yeah. So I see that dialogue just loops when I move to the next one. And uh, yeah, I need to also work on some choices as well. But yeah, the movement's done with a gazing system. And like I said, I want to talk individually about every sort of function that's running the engine at the minute. So I'm going to go quite in depth, so it's going to be one of those videos. You can also interact with prefab objects, so that's a prefab. What prefab means is basically just, uh, that's a custom GLB model that I've loaded into the engine. And then on the map, which is basically defined with different numbers and strings, uh, that will refer that, that stri this, which is this index item in the array is a string which corresponds to a certain base like coded basically which then tells the engine how to present that prefab like I said a lot of this is and that's like water, you've got water here you've also got like different depths of uh, wall you've got enemies which I'm just working on at the minute though they're not in the map editor at the minute Papyrus 3D also does include a map editor, that's quite important. Um, the map loop is basically how these environments get created. Uh, at the minute I'm also trying to figure out how I'm going to do lighting properly, because again I don't want to add too much complication to the actual um, array that gets created which creates these maps. Uh, but I am getting a bit ahead of myself in my explanations here. It's starting to look quite cool. Um, Starting to become a bit more of a, you know, thing. I'll show it, just demo one other thing which we've been working on, which is just loading, clearing scene and loading at the minute an outdoor scene. Started trying to think about how I'm going to handle outdoor scenes. 
that's not fully finished that's it yet, so that's that uh, anyway that's probably enough of that um, I'll keep I'll just keep that open in case I need to jump back to it at any point just mute this uh, right, so let's have a look so there's a few different commands when you actually download the repo you've got npm install obviously if you install all the packages with local testing, you have to generate an SSL. Um, it's all explained here, running that. And then your npm run dev to run a local dev server for actually testing it. There's also a build system for building it for uh, to desktop if you want, which does work. It's just on with Electron. Run npm run this is the command for that. I'm not going to go too much into all that because, again, it's still a work in progress. This is all just an explanation of what it's all about. The idea of it is. Uh, this is as it is we've got some electron configuration here but this is not something you'll probably ever have to worry about so i'm not going to talk about it too much just electron just telling where to bundle it and stuff but this will never really chip if you're a user of the system you'll never really have to change this unless you want to go in there and I don't know, somehow modify it but you probably wouldn't have to again just an electron thing main js isn't related to any of this in fact if you are going to be using this uh as a user, you, everything that you'll be using is in this container, this public folder. Distribution, which is uh, under git ignore, uh, is ignored because it's just the build that's produced by when the build command's triggered, so you'd never have to touch that ever really, unless you just wanted to download it. That's why it's greyed out in visual code, which is pseudo code. This is just a front page for the um, GitHub pages because I'm hosting it at the minute on GitHub pages. Which may well change, or I might just get a custom um, domain at some point. Anyway, this is all very boring. Let's actually get into how I conceive of this actually working, right, in terms of the actual structure. So public, like I said, public is where all the files basically for any um, game you'll be making will be. I do still have to do a bit of tidying up here. I'm probably going to delete AR example, for, exa for example, because... I don't think I really need to separate them out because when you're actually on a mobile device, you can switch between the VR and AR. So um, I might actually do that now because it's sort of pointless it being there. Yeah, I'm just going to delete that now. It's a bit confusing as well. Just confuses people probably. Engine, this is where the core code is. I'll just talk one by one about all the, the, the structure and the directory for public. So you've got Papyrus, which is the engine core. And like I said, again, I'm going to go top to bottom down about um, both of these uh, scripts quite shortly. So I'm going to go quite in depth, but for now, I'm just going to show you that. Components is the component library. Uh, in about however long it takes to get through all this stuff, I'll next talk about Papyrus. I'll start with Papyrus, which is the engine core. And then I'll talk about the component system because they sort of work together as one bigger whole Essentially, the entire engine code is both of them together. I just don't want to have to... I mean, the code at the minute is about 12,000 lines, so in total, papyrus and components. And I just think it's better to keep them both separate as opposed to having a, you know, 12,000 line script to have to go through. And obviously, like, some of this can be... A lot of this will actually be have to be uh, simplified. At the minute, it's, there is some... You know, like duplication, that's how it is currently. So you've got 755 in Papyrus. A lot of which can probably be simplified for sure. I'm doing a lot of like um, direct, um, uh, direct uh, manipulation of the scene with uh, Vanilla JS. I'm not sure if I can simplify any of that. Some repetition in some places too, so. Again, something I'm aware I can can probably reduce, but like I said, it's a work. It's a in progress code base, so that's going to happen. It's pre alpha. Anyway, that's the engine folder. Models obviously is just but needs to be tidied up a lot. But these are just models I'm using for GLB models, for example, that I'm using to um, load in models and such. Scenes uh, is quite important, so 
scenes where we have all our scene information. Um, this is essentially actually the core of the and if, if you're a user coming in to use this, it's unlikely you're going to touch Papyrus or components unless you, need, you wanted to edit the source code for the engine, which you would be allowed to do under the GNU. Um, because it's GNU um, licensed, you could do that. You'd, you'd have to release, if you did modify it, you'd have to release it under the same license, but you'd be f fine to do that. Um, and then models, you just change to whatever models you want to use. Obviously, this is going to become a lot more organized when the actual f full demo version is done. But anyway, if you were coming into this system as a user, like if you say you cloned the repo or however I'm going to eventually set up the interface, you go into scenes and you'd be mostly editing these dialogue, um, these um, JSON files. So choices is one I'm just working on now. I've not actually fully finished it. And the same with the whole dialogue system actually in general. Look, I've just started testing it out recently. But this is just the JSON file, which has a character reference for the character on the scene, position for the text, yada, yada, yada. So you have like, the actual, actual, actual text there. Uh, interactions is the same thing, but that's more for something I just re decided to do recently. It's more interactions with objects instead of people. Dialogue would be... Uh, like I said, this isn't finished, but yeah, there you go. Map. So, this might look quite confusing, but basically this is just a two-dimensional array which gets transformed into the actual maps in the game. So, what happens is this data um, this array, which is just a 25 by tw 25, uh, it's 50, I think. Yeah, 50. No, it's not. It's 100. 100 characters in there. Let's just check that. So that's 25 by 25 flat array, basically. This has come from the map editor, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, but the map editor basically allows me to put in, define different areas of geometry, which the engine then interprets. So easiest ones to start off with, zero is just a flat four. All these different zeros you can see here. That's all interpreted by the engine as just a flat floor. One obviously is just a wall, like a solid wall, like a solid wall up like that. Uh, but then you can see obviously there's these strings that go in there, which is a newer thing I'm starting to do. So that with, you could, uh, so say if you wanted, for example, a, a uh, wall, but with a custom height, uh, you can do that as well. But the end, the when I'm in the, the map editor, it puts that in as uh, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, with the number representing the greater height. And then there's also this, which is part of the prefab system. So again, this doesn't mean anything if you don't look at it. And you, uh, as a user, you wouldn't actually have to manually, obviously, do these things, which would be a nightmare. Because the map editor handles all that. So the map editor, which is one of the tools, um, basically creates this map, generates this map, which I'm still working on implementing all of new features. And then it, um, say for example, if you were to have a prefab, seven is just a code in the engine for prefab. One is the number of the prefab. T is, means it has a trigger for interaction. So if that wasn't there, it doesn't get triggered. And then one is the uh, interaction on here, which would get triggered. So in this case, it would be... I'm still figuring out exactly the best way to do that in the editor, but that's that. And then you've got char one, which is also uh, just a character reference. So that means character and then one, because you can obviously have multiple characters. So if it, and then six is water. That just represents water in the map. So if you can see before you, that sort of makes sense. And uh, three is just a different um, preset for um, uh, like wall height. I think it's three qu three quarters. And then there's also a half as well. But I don't think I'm in that geometry in there. So you could obviously do. It just helps to have like some predefined ones and then some more custom ones with this, basically. And then there's five. No, there's four, which is a door. That just represents a door, basically, that you can open and lock. Anyway, that's the map. Uh, one limitation of the map at present is you have to make it a fixed width and height. So 25 by 25, 50 by 50, exactly, or you have to be exactly the same width and height. So I couldn't do, for example, 28 by 23. It just wouldn't work properly. But that's that. There's some metadata about the scene. Not much of that has that much effect yet. Some of it's probably irrelevant now, but 
this is definitely relevant. So if this is indoor, it gen the engine generates the ceiling. If it's outdoor, it generates an outdoor area. It's an environment component with A-frame. But again, this is not. This is sort of something I'm working on. Textures are simply the textures, um, which um, I'm not sure if that's going to still be relevant. I can't remember how much it's used, but it is relevant actually, Like I think. I need to remember, but again, that texture is, is actually something I'm thinking about a bit at the minute. Because uh, I might have to possibly modify the map editor so you can apply custom textures or like a t custom texture reference, if that makes sense. Uh, but again, I don't think it's probably worth complicating it too much. I just basically, ideally, I think you want to have it so in the JSON I can put, you know, brick one, brick two, maybe two alternatives, and then just have that set. But again, it's not something I'm worrying about too much at the minute. And then, yeah, like, obviously, like, scene two would be, like, basically a new map that you'd move to, and you'd have to, like, you wouldn't, you'd have to, like, definitely redo that, definitely repeat that. Um, and probably the textures too. And then, yeah. So, for example, if we go here, this is an example of an outdoor scene. You can see I've changed that, and that was the scene that was loaded before as I'm testing that part of the engine. Anyway, there's obviously a lot more detail going into that, but I'm not going to yet because it's not actually finished. So again, it would be pointless. Uh, and then we have some other files here like uh, config, which is basically just, um, so that's relevant, I see false. So if you put that, if that's the false and true flag for the gun, so not all games are gonna have a gun. Um, Prefabs is the prefabs library. So like I was saying before, like the computer that's loaded in, that's the reference for that there. It gets the model reference, it's got the computer, the ID, all that sort of thing, scale of animations. And that just basically comes from models and then a computer in it. So that that folder I was talking about before. Obviously sound, just sounds, whatever sounds. Some of these need to replace it because they're WAV files. Test maps is just some random test maps I made while I've been going along. Textures is this massive texture library we've got, which not all of which is being used, so some of it will probably be stripped out. Um, all right, now we've got this the next thing, and then you just got like this, which is you know, just do effects things. Ah, yeah, so obviously, index is important. So, how it's actually working at the minute is there's one index file, which is simply a HTML file. I'm doing all the asset loading. Um, probably it's way over the top at the minute. Like if I was, I'm going to actually have to strip a lot of it out. But um, I suppose I should talk about this bit. I'll just go a bit. Oh, I should talk fairly in depth about it, and it's probably a good place to start as well because this is the entry point for the entire application. And then it basically dynamically gets cleared, and then reloaded when you open a new scene. And then the, uh, hey, all the, I think most of the asset loading is done with HTML. But I'll explain that in a bit, actually. So it's quite confusing, probably. Uh, let's get full screen, I suppose. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit. I always forget how to zoom in on. Because uh, it's... Why does it never work? Oh, it's so not okay with... Anyway, hopefully you can see that all right. Let's see if I can... We have to press function key 11. There we go, that's why. Got one of those annoying laptops where you have to click function key. View, zoom in, wherever it is. I'm still so used to WebStorm. I'm still not really used to this one. This ID, it's just Visual Studio. I actually don't like it as much. I'll probably start to use WebStorm again. How do I zoom in again on this? It's annoying. It's Oh yeah. Well, how have I not done that? Yeah, I did that. There we go. All right, whatever. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, not that. Apologise for this. this. Is just me being stupid. Control K and Z. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, to zoom it out a bit. Well, I'll zoom in a bit. So, right, 
I'm just using CDN references for now, that might change. Probably should change actually, it's just been as I'm going along I'm using CDN. I'm not sure actually if it works, because I've tested packaging it up and it actually does seem to work. Anyway, CDN references for the A-frame core, minified, it's the A-frame, it's actual, um, what's handling the, it's the library that handles the generation of WebGL, A-frame environment component and A-frame extras, that's it. I'm trying to keep it really simple as well, I don't want to overload it. There are a ton of stuff I could probably add, but I don't want to, I want to keep it quite simple. Why don't this do one thing and one thing well, basically. Okay, so we've got our actual A scene here, and then we've got our assets. And I'm manually adding the assets, and the IDs are obviously very important at the minute. Uh, so probably users will have to manually add their assets here. Uh, I'm going to try and get around this because it is actually a bit annoying. Obviously, if you had to, if you as a user have to manually add all your assets in here with the appropriate IDs, otherwise it won't work. Um, now it won't be like predefined IDs. Obviously, that'd be stupid. But you just have to do in the JSON. You're going to have to associate these with ID wise with. Uh, so obviously, I'm going to simplify all that because at the minute it's a bit of a mess. So you got your. So Bob is like the the character that in the yellow in the scene before. Gun is the gun model. Blah 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 blah. Computer's the you know, and then you, and then it associates in the JSON with the ID, um, which is all right way, but. If there was a way of being up, there's probably a fairly easy way I can do a loop or something and load all that in, but yeah, that's basically what that is now. Audio, it's just audio. So all the audio that's used in the game, just let, some of which needs changing because it's WAV files which are way too big. It should be MP3 or OGS. Don't know what that's doing there. That shouldn't be there. I'm going to get rid of that. This should not be there. Textures, same again. Then just close the assets. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into too much of this because the rest of this other stuff you probably will never have to touch. It's just basically an NCC system for the camera. Uh, this is not stuff you'd ever have to touch because the entire idea of the, doing a lot of the code is that it will just, it's basically just the UI basically. It should be standardized, but obviously if you wanted to, you could uh, go in there and start tinkering around. The actual NC, the actual um, maps themselves get loaded into this entity with the ID of room and that gets cleared and populated um, per level change basically and then I've got the references to the component library and the engine core here which is loaded in as a module because I'm using imports and exports in JavaScript anyway let's go on to the next thing All right, so go on to now I think I've yarbled on enough there. I've yarbled on quite a lot, actually. This is going to be quite a long video, sorry. Let's go into the actual engine core. So I'm just going to go into this mode again. There we go. Right, there we go. So this is the full Papyrus core. Um, at, at present, it's not completely finished, but again, I actually don't need that player one. That was an older idea. I'm just going to get rid of that. It's not used, is it? Yeah. yeah. Never read, okay, give you that. So there's a lot here. This is basically like sort of the top level globals for the um, global variables for the engine. Um, so we've got a player, some stores for the uh, enemies, characters, the configuration, same for this here, the stores basically for dialogues, metadata, interactions, uh, not something I'm using, so I'm gonna get rid of it. That's something I was trying out before. Locked doors, I can probably start very useful, but I'll leave it there. Um, textures, prefab, same thing. Get loaded into an array after they are, um, yeah, basically all this is is just uh, a bunch of predefined values for a, um, a bunch of things that get loaded into the engine when it gets booted up, basically when it gets called, when the load data function gets called. So this is actually quite a key function in the entire engine. Load data is a synchronous uh, load data, and it basically loads a ton of JSON into the engine. Um, which is already configured, so you've got loading player, player information, loading textures with the current scene passed in as a parameter, 
because obviously you need to change it per scene one two three four five six etc this is like their initial preloading um this would change probably um this is just while i'm testing it out i'm just pre-populating it but it would probably actually be current scene uh, or something different well no maybe not i don't know i'm still trying to work out that but yeah basically loading player load textures load the config load the characters load the enemies load the prefab library um create the rooms which is very key function loading the map button as well populate dialogue yada yada that's something i don't even know um so yeah there's basic i'll just show the basic um this would be quite a good one actually because it's where the gun config comes in um so you got your config loaded in here it's obviously from here uh Actually, that's, yeah, so, be, okay, right. So, a little bit easier. So we've got a fetch request for config JSON. It fetches that, uh, converts to JSON. And then I'll get that property of gun, which is a, in the JSON itself, it's just a true or false. And then it either makes the gun visible or not based on that. So that's that, uh, and then it's basically the same for everything. So you can play a JSON, just loads it into a big JSON that you can JSON file that can be read, and you know that's it really for that part. Because like I said, the, the key principle of the engine is that pre-configured with JSON, and then it sort of just works. I mean, it does make it quite um, opinionated, I suppose. But again, this is like something I'm doing as an experiment just to see if I can do it myself pretty much but also I think it, again it makes it I want to make it relatively open without you know driving myself insane at the same time <laughs> set up player info it's just the player info so the name health creates an object to player uh, this is something I need to work on still but yeah player face state for like if, well, I'd have a face and then a UI but I've not actually done that implement that bit too much yet Add character is quite important function. It's basically the same as the enemy function, except uh, it just adds a character. It's just a console log there, obviously. But then you got the character JSON characters, the specific ID that's been passed. Uh, the ID, the model reference, um, creates an ent so with vanilla JS, just create an entity. Do attribute setting. This is there's a lot of this in here. Probably I need to. This is not bad, I don't think. Like I'm basically just doing it directly with vanilla JS, but also there is some repetition because of this that's emerged in some places. I'll sh you'll see what I mean when I get a bit further down. So, but I'm nowhere near that um, refactoring point. GLTF model just basically loads it in as this with this reference. So the reference is already in, in the HTML and it'll load in whatever. Um, model ref has been passed to it but yeah model ref so the character the specific character that's passed through here with the id will be looked up and then it'll get it that way basically so model ref and then it's just adding a hash before it uh the name blah 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 scale animation and loop enemies just the same just with an enemy instead of a character Add a torch is something I was working on a while ago, but I've not actually revisited, but I might well revisit. It just adds a torch, basically. Um, creates a light, basically. It basically creates a light. Ended with a custom colour. Um, but I've not actually looked into that yet that much. Popular dialogue, obviously, is quite important. So there's dialogue ID, which is in the HTML. Shows dialogue ID, uh, UI, which is a function somewhere down here, which basically just stops it from being hidden. Uh, adds a button if it's not already there, so does a check here for that. Uh, like I said, not all of this has been tested. I don't know if it's all going to work, but I'll just try and go over the basics. Um, okay, like looks up dialogue passage, the specific passage ID that's been passed into the function. Um, it returns the text there, returns the character name. It sets the c 
current dialogue ID to passage ID, blah, 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 blah. This does some setup with the HTML, blah, 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 the text component, sorry, and uh, sets the wrap count. That's that as displays it in the UI, the direct, and character name, new passage information. Population, popular in interactions is the same thing except for interactions. Again, this is something I've just done, so I'm not sure if it works with me. Make character active is to do with adding a glow effect, which is something I'm experimenting with. Next scene, quite important. So that basically um, loads the next scene up. Ah, so. Uh, yeah, it was. No, no, sorry, not loads the next scene up. It navigates through the hierarchy of the dialogue to get to the next, to proceed to the next uh, passage, basically, in the JSON. So I'm still wanting to actually modify this a bit, but essentially it just finds the length of the passage that's there, minuses it by one, because uh, there's something to do with array checking, index checking. Um, uh, it iterates current dialogue ID. So, and then populates, runs that function populate to reshow the dialogue, makes the character active, and then we've got a timeout here so that after a certain amount of time, which is about 10 seconds, the dialogue will disappear. That's that. Now there's probably some stuff I need to work on to do on that still. Load new level is actually calling a bunch of other functions to say synchronous. It clears the scene, so it clears the scene graph which I'm not fully sure of. I need to actually do some testing on that just to make sure it does actually properly clear. I'm not actually sure completely. Uh, loads the scene metadata and then it goes, if it's an out indoor room, it'll do the load map again and then it'll create the rooms, which is another bit, a big function we're coming up to soon. So dialogue UI is just a visibility thing. Hide is obviously the opposite of that. Add button. This is the button for scrolling through navigation. Just a bunch of um, element, a box element, which just gets a bunch of attributes added to it. Uh, some of it's a bit rough already, I need to really test it out. Uh, create choice button, same thing, not really done that much on it. Remove button to never use actually at the minute, but it basically just removes the button, and that also needs replacing because it's Bob Guys, just a testing entity. Got key is a function I'm not finished, which is going to basically be for checking keys, doors, that opening them basically. Create rooms, All right, okay, this is quite a fundamental function in the actual creation of the maps. Uh, map data is the map JSON, so the, what I was talking about before of all the different symbols, the 25 by 25 array, that gets loaded in here, map source data, and the map data is the constant variable that represents that data in this function. Uh, room type is just the type of room, indoor or outdoor, basically. And then we get char loop index, which is all tied in with the loop that gets cre eventually created. Wall size, wall height, these are um, predefined uh, which, um, height settings. That's the room, so where the actual element, which you get, you'll see now a lot, EL, the constant now gets used a lot for actually appending the. Uh, the um, the elements that get created, the boxes that get created. Anyway, so we've got an if and else here. It's like a pre-flight, pre-loop check. So if the room is an indoor, then you, we have, I create an, um, a ceiling, and then I append that ceiling, which basically just makes sure I cover the entire area with a with a ceiling. Basically, if it's an indoor map. So the ceiling area is, we'll see, map size is width times height, essentially. So the height of the array that's here, so it'll be 25 by 25. That's that, basically. Ceiling area, that's just does fairly simple. It's just the area, works out the area. All right, uh, scene data is, basically this is not quite finished, but it was the second map we saw loading up before. So, um, add a new room, because I have to, I will have cleared it from before, usually. The, I might have to have a check for that too, because it's not necessarily the case every time. Uh, add an environment, so this is the environment component, 
and then I do one a basic loop, which is much less basic, which is much more basic, sorry, than the, the main loop for if it's an indoor scene. And it just adds the floor, which will probably be invisible, but this is mostly for the navigation movement, which I'll explain a bit later. Um, and it's actually triggered by having the editor listener here. Sorry, I'm going on quite a lot. Uh, environment, yeah, this is basically a preset set at the minute, but he's modifying later. And then I add the room. That's a bit confusing though, because that's like the, that's sort of like the pre-flight check. But generally, the loop that will be running is this one, I think. And like I said, because of that, trying to add in the environment stuff, the outdoor scene stuff, I'm getting that a bit more advanced. This is sort of a bit messy at the minute, even more so than usual. So this is a for loop. I mean, it's nested for loop basically. So get the height of the width, so and then uh, yeah, all this. So this is but I didn't obviously do all this algorithm. I've got a few different um, calculations here which I've managed to work out. So floor positioning. Uh, I'm not going to over, go over all this, but the floor positioning position. Uh, I, like I don't, to be honest with you, I don't fully understand all of it myself, like what's exactly what's going on. I understand the broad principle of it, obviously it's like a, it's basically doing this. Da, 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 da. And then every time it goes to a X, it's going duh as well, so it's doing, it's like da 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 da, da 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 If you imagine the loop, it's going da 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 Da, 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 basically, and it's, and it's drawing all of the A boxes that I add on here and set here with various attributes. Uh, you've got components in here as added as well, editor listener, glow effects. Um, this is for a character, so this is adding a character actually. Um, probably actually that should be done, so I'll worry, but I don't know. Look at that, yeah, that's it. Here it's checking if it's a string, because it's one of the string, um, doing various checks. Not the best way to do that, but prefabs is also the same thing. So is the array index in the current loop, is it a string? So Because obviously some of them are strings, some of them are just pure numbers. So it's doing that check first, and then it's doing a check for the array index. The character is seven, because it needs to determine what sort of um, entity to render so if it's checking if it's seven if it's a string it's seven this is a lot of uh, this is probably not all the best way to do it I don't I do not know yet I'm just this is sort of you know like I said still test so phrase I'm using um, prefab trigger is prefab number is it more than nine blah blah blah, blah. then area index uh, map data Character at three, blah blah blah, or character at two. That's basically to do with the trigger being there. But there's a bunch of just basically these ex expressions here which check a bunch of like pre flight checks, I guess, until to determine what sort of prefab to load. Again, this is something I've been working on, so it's not really that finished. Uh, prefab element number actually should, shouldn't be that, it should have to be. It'll have to be more customized, like I said, this is halfway done. It creates an entity anyway. Adds a GLTF model because you want obviously the part the point of all this is to load in a custom model. And then we've got our various um, properties for the associated uh, model there, which would be loaded in. So scale, rotation, blah blah blah. Um, again, this is probably a bit buggy at the minute. I'm still currently working on it. Okay, so then you depend it to the floor item, which is just basically a, a, a flat bit of floor, a bit of box. This is all a bit confusing because the way I've done it, it will sort of make sense. Nine is a is an enemy slot at the minute. It's just a zero. Uh, I need to probably work on creating multiple enemy slots so it probably will turn into a string. It's the same as character really. But, uh, yeah, I don't want to waste too much time. Water is just six. So that's just got some settings, some textures and some specific uh, settings for water within the materials so that's the only thing really unique about that uh, map uh, and uh, yeah I don't know, I'm, gonna, I'm probably spending a lot of time on this oh so obviously I'm gonna get player movement set up for that which is tied in with uh, position you know, actually when you look and position and move this is gonna be a really long video actually I'm sorry <laughs> 
torch light, it's not something that's been used much for a minute. There's a nice little note there. I think this is for... Okay, I don't know what that's for. That's something that was... Oh, I had a camera. I'm not using it, I'm not using that at the minute, but that would be adding a camera, basically. So, this is where most of it happens, I think. Yeah, so... This is where most of the walls will get created. So, you create a wall. Add different positioning, size, height, etc. Append it to the element, so zero. Dun, 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 dun. There's a lot of stuff here, obviously. So this is a custom wall, for example. Which is diff so the only difference here would be checking for the data for the string, like I said before, which sometimes when it has a custom height, have a trigger check, which just basically takes the checks for the number, does a trigger check, returns true or false if, if there's a T at a certain position, does that check, and then various things happen, like you can add the trigger dialog at the floor, which is something I've done a while back so you can trigger basically have add a trigger to any floor as well. And then these are the generic ones. This which is probably a more simple part, I don't know why I started it start with it. <laughs> but it's further down. So it's one is full wall, full height wall, half height wall, so just divided by two. Uh, quarter height wall, so just divided by four. Yada yada yada, door, just a door. So you have that. a few different things here, like locked, false, passed down, door, which is a component. So it defines it as a door component, which is very important. And yeah, it just adds a floor again. Door locked. So that's just a separate type of door, which I've not actually implemented yet. I don't think, I, mean, I have, but it's not probably worth working yet. Anyway, so yeah, number four is a door, mm, string type four, and then some other stuff is a locked door, basically. Basically. There's some stuff I was thinking of on the map, but I'm not going to go to that. Combat system. Well, shit. There's none of the, <laughs> this. is so much to go through. So, um, this does work, sort of. So this is the shooting at functionality. So shoot at and then the enemy ID. Uh, current enemy, enemy's ID, blah, blah, blah. enemy const, I don't know why I've called it that. Well, oh, constitution, yeah, so. Basically, it does, this combat system at present is sort of based on a sort of D&D uh, &D system. You obviously trigger the audio, just get the query selector for the, uh, the query, the selector for the sound, which is player attack, and play it. Trigger muzzle effects is only separate function for making the visibility on the muzzle effect. There's sort of flash. Piece does just with an LJS really, just some DOM manipulation. Uh, same for the hit audio, and then we do a little calculation here, random dice roll, which is another function just basically for determining random numbers with a min and max, one and maximum combat damage. And then blah blah blah, just console log that and then return it. And then this is the enemy combat attack, which is basically the same thing, just the way around. Get player health, which returns the player health as just a property there, like health, the health, whatever it's been set to. I don't know if it works for it yet. That's just the muzzle stuff for visibility switching. Um, so yeah, it just runs that, and then there's a timer just to take it, so it basically just flashes up. Health bar, which I don't even think is used, I'm not even sure if it will be. That's just the random function, minimax, fairly standard. Clear scene, which is how I'm doing it at the minute. Element scene, just remove all the, remove the remove all the everything. And then I export a bunch of functions out which are used by components, like next scene, loading level, populate dialogue, anything that's basically used. And then I import them into the components library. Which after all Okay, so now we'll go into the component library. Into the component library next. Let's talk a bit about that. Right, let's get that out of the way. So, component library is um, also quite large. It's got five thousand like that yet. Yeah, well, six hundred lines, just a bit smaller than the actual engine code. Just make this big, so not big enough. There we go. So let's get rid of our imports here. So they're importing in some functions from the engine core. 
uh, Curse the Listener, which is to do with... Uh, I think it's... Yeah, moves on to the... Uh, it's used when navigating onto the next scene, so the next actual dialogue really it should be... I should rename that, but basically I have an event listener for a click event and then there's an intersection that occurs and it loads the next scene. Turn monitor I actually need to get rid of because it's not used anymore. That was why I initially had this idea of doing turn based movement. This is completely irrelevant. It doesn't need to be here. I think. I'm pretty sure actually. I'm not sure, well, I'm not sure, so I'll just leave it for now. But player health. This is a health bar for the player, which I'm still working on. And actually comes up as undefined if I try and use it now so it's not finished. Start game button, this is the start button at the start. And then yeah, obviously it loads the uh, it's the initialized button basically. You've got a mouse enter. So when a mouse enters that, basically looks at it, it yeah, just basically loads, calls that function that loads the data and initiates basically the start of the uh, and then it removes it itself from uh, the scene and triggers this element destroy which is free, uh, glow effects is a uh, you've, got, you've got a schema as well which is quite important in components so you've got a color you can set a custom color and visible glow effects is going to be for basically when you're looking at something important or someone important it just adds like a sort of reference for you, a visual reference. Player cam, obviously pretty important, quite big as well. Mm, this is a lot here. <laughs> so how, a lot of this is actually needs trimming down, but you know, I don't know what colours there. I'm not sure if I need that there, but position, rotation, standard, stick scale, camera number. That is probably irrelevant now. Some of this is quite relevant because I was originally going to have it so you could just have like cameras you can move around to develop the cursor system. In fact, yeah, you can like I have this idea of like, triggering a test mode and stuff. Probably irrelevant now. I don't know how much it's used actually. So I'm going to that can actually be trimmed out. Like I said, like a lot of this stuff is a work in progress. Character is definitely used. So color, if you want to change the color of character model path then there's a default it's provided position rotation scale and standard is it animated so I'm, am i using animations it's sort of true or false flag and glow on us is true or false access to those data items in the schema of this this data const data element is this the uh, so don't have to put this l element every time uh, model path which is this data item and that's accessing that in the schema Yada yada, all the all for those as well. It's a scheme right? And then uh oh, the scale, same thing. Uh no, I don't know, actually that might be a mistake. And then a uh, character container. Okay. And then yeah, just basically set the animation if certain conditions are true. And then yeah. Uh that's what here we've got. How to listen to pop plate dialogue from the click. Uh, I'm not sure how much of that's relevant anymore, so I don't know. But basically just that sort. Uh, health bar for enemies, which I need to actually look back at to re-adding, but there is a health bar that should be added. I'm not going to go on too much now, actually. There should be a bit of GLB and OBJ model switching there. And then we have some different events for... This is all a bit of a mess, so I need to look into this and just see how much is redundant I guess but then we've got a click event so this is something I'm currently working on quite a bit so the click events are that's for trigger you know determining the tr shooting at and then it, this is a check uh, for if the enemy's alive basically and if they're alive then do these things distance checks and such combat check uh, and then in the tick function, like I said, this is the enemy component actually does need a bit of. I've got a bunch of functions here for a lot of stuff, which is not working fully yet. <laughs> but basically, move random, I'll start with that. Distance check is here. So the idea of this, I thought, would be to 
if I can find a box, they've all got obviously these associated zeros and ones with it. So if I could check if it's a floor and if it's not a it hasn't got the class name floor, but I've not actually tested that much yet. Then move away from it basically. So if it if the ant was to approach something which is not a floor, then it start it just moves in the opposite direction. But I've not got that working properly yet. Move to player is just a bit bit of behaviour so that it moves towards the player if it's within a certain distance, the enemy or the ants in the case that they don't work out now. You never have to worry about any of this if you're not that's the whole point, that's what I'm trying to make it good. Or half decent anyway. Anyway, that's all quite a lot of stuff to go into. It will take ages to fully go into it and I'm still working it out. Uh Player movement's quite important. This is this is pretty simple actually, but this is how the movement system works. So the element, which is the gaze cursor in this example, I know the whatever element, no, not the gaze cursor, it's whatever. So basically you've got a floor and it's got player movement or whatever objects you've got has the player movement component on it. It listens for a click event, which is just a gaze event basically. It gets the element, uh, gets the position. Uh, gets the position of the player camera, which you can grab with a query selector, and then just sets the position of the player camera to the new position, which has got here from that this get attribute position, and object uh, modifies its uh, position to 1.5. Uh, yeah, but basically resets the position. That's what it does. Um, trigger dialog floor is for triggering floor dialogs. So a similar sort of thing. I was looking into removing it as well once it's been triggered, but I don't know, it's a half done. Prefab component, um, that's, all to, that's all to do with triggering dialogues and then triggering a specific uh, interaction that's been passed down once from the pre, in the prefab. So basically when you deter, when, you, when, it, when the prefab is given this component of prefab, you pass it down interaction number. Uh, again, this is all happening on the engine level. It wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't really have to do this yourself, but just see that's how it works. And you'd populate that with that, which sort of works the minute because it works the computer interaction. Door, some obviously I'm trying to work on the locking on that and stuff, but that just basically triggers the opening of a door, and that's fairly simple. It just um, yeah determines a new X position. So just minus is one. That's it. When when that click event's determined, and I was also trying to add the closed door, but for some reason it's not working. I've already tested it recently, so I don't know why. It'd be probably just literally how I'm calling it, I guess. Anyway, I can't get off too much track because I really need to get through all this now. Key component, which is just went to key, but I've not actually got that far with that yet. I'm gonna have to have some way of monitoring all that. And I don't know, it's like not that important at the minute. Loading texture, it's just texture loader. Not even sure if I'm using it. Exits for exits. Anyway, I've actually gone on talking for ages. I'm gonna just close this down. Like I've talked for ages, I realise there's quite a lot of code actually to go over. Um, <laughs> look at a hell of a lot actually. I've not even covered the map editor, which is basically actually got the same code, but with some fancy stuff like um, uh, the JSON exporting, and it's actually a bit of a mess, let's see. To be honest, the, well, it's not that bad, but the map editor needs a lot of tidying up in terms of, well, actually, I've been harsh on myself, it's not that bad, but that basically mixes the components. But a lot of it's just basically the same thing, just with interfacing. So that's basically, basically that's the same thing. And then the only bit here that's a bit different, you got the export JSON. We <gasps> try to make it so you can import in a map as well. So you can save maps and basically load them in later. Pretty essential. It's very rough and ready there, so only 400 lines or something. Uh, anyway, I'm getting pretty tired now, so I'm going to finish this. It's been a fairly long <laughs> video, so I'm going to assume if you watch this, you're very interested in the subject. Hope it's been of interest anyway if you have. Been honoured. Bye. Uh, keep an eye on Papyrus. Like, 
it is starting to get somewhere i think maybe in a month or so it should be ready for um public consumption on some level and hopefully someone will find it useful once it's done all right bye